welcome. Um, how many of us are already doing functional programming, have played with functional programming? Awesome. Any object-oriented practitioners who are looking to switch to functional programming? Cool, a few. Awesome. Excellent. So today we'll talk about Loom and functional graphs, but specifically how we implement them in Clojure. However, even though I'll spoke, uh, focus on Clojure implementation of functional graphs, a lot of these ideas are easily translatable to other functional languages. So a little bit about me. I work at Google on a distributed build system. So in my day job, I write C++. Why am I here at a functional programming conference? Well, I write closure on weekends and weeknights. And I'm the maintainer of library called Loom, which is graph algorithms and visualization library. Um, so I got into closure about maybe two years ago, first starting out with just you know some little hobby projects, exercises. And then I wanted to work on graph algorithms because my background is, um, some of my background is in compiler research. And uh, in compilers, you represent programs as graphs. So I wanted to do more of graph manipulations. So I started looking around for existing graph uh, algorithms libraries because you know, it's always better to pick up something that is already written well. And I came across Loom, which was initially written by Justin Kramer, and um, then Justin moved on to other projects. And I really liked the way it was designed, and I liked a lot of things that it already had in it. So I decided to pick it up, add more algorithms to it, and make it as usable as possible for other um, people. And if you're wondering, yes, I did make that logo. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this talk will be in four parts. First, we'll talk about graph um, theory in general. How many of us have taken graph theory class or have dealt with graphs in general? OK, a few of us. So this will be a good point for us to get on the same page. And then we'll talk about graph API design, which in my opinion is one of the most fascinating things to think about. How do you represent graphs such that they're flexible but also are efficient? Then we'll talk about uh, graph algorithms and how we would implement them functionally. Specifically, we would look at the object-oriented implementation and then side-by-side -side compare it to the functional implementation. And at last, we will uh, do an overview of Loom and what Loom does for you and uh, if you're interested in how you can jump into using uh, graph algorithms library. So let's take a moment of graph theory first. So graphs are collections of nodes and edges um, and the nodes are connected by edges. So on this graph we see uh, five nodes A, B, C, and D which are connected by some edges. And graphs are all over in um, real life. So we have you know, subway maps or um, transportation maps where it tells us how to get from point A to point B. We can calculate distances. We can calculate the cost. There are social network graphs. So you can figure out how information gets propagated from one person to another, what uh, types of clicks get formed, how people get to uh, know each other, and so on. And um, since I work on build systems, for me, dependency graphs are something that I deal with in day-to-day -day, uh, life. So um, when you have a source code and you specify uh, in your, say, make file how to pull other de dependencies and how to link libraries, then you'll create something like this, where um, on the bottom, you'll start out with all the different files, the header files and the C files, and then you know, create the binaries and then link them up and so on. And there are also network graphs. Um, programs are represented as graphs, as I mentioned, and compilers. And three data structures that probably all of you are dealing with in your everyday jobs are also structured as graphs. Um, they're just a you know, more uh, specific example of graphs. So what kinds of graphs are there? Well, there is um, just simple graphs, undirected graphs, where um, nodes are connected by edges. There's also weighted graphs where now each edge has some weight associated with it. There are directed graphs, also known as digraphs, where now the edge has a specific direction. So in this case, there is an edge, a directed edge between A to B, so there's a way to get from A to B. And you can also assign weights to those edges. Now more um, exotic types of graphs, uh, but still are very commonly used, are multigraphs, where you can have multiple edges between two nodes. So they're usually used for, suppose you want to figure out whether you should drive from uh, Boulder to New York, or you want to fly from Boulder to New York. It will tell you how many hours it will take you to drive, or how many hours it will take you to fly, and you can associate the cost, associate, um, 
uh, with it traversing that distance and so on. Another cool type of graph is mixed graphs, where you have undirected edges and directed edges in the same graph. So those are commonly used to represent job shop scheduling problems. So um, those are the problems where you have big job, and then you can separate it out into multiple tasks. And now the directed edge specifies the precedence of tasks. So which task, in this case, task B has to be executed after task A. And undirected edge specifies which task cannot be executed concurrently. For, uh, in this case, C and D, for some reason, cannot be executed concurrently. For instance, we may know that they are using a lot of resources, and our system may not be able to support that amount of your resources. Okay, so now that we looked a little bit at gra on, uh, graph theory, let's talk about graph API design. Also, in object-oriented languages, <coughs> we'll have you know, something where it's, like, it's a class node, object node, which has some data associated with it, and we have object edge, which has two nodes that it actually connects, and we have a class graph, which has collections of nodes and edges. And, you know, of course, edge can also have some attributes associated with it and so on. So, um, but let's talk about more abstractly how we can represent graphs first. So, same graph as we saw earlier, we have five nodes, A, B, C, and D, and A, B, C, D, and E, and we will label the edges. So now there are four general types of graph representations. You can represent graphs using adjacency lists. Um, each node is mapped to a list of its adjacent successor nodes. In this case, um, A is mapped to B because there's an edge between A and B, and B actually has two edges um, to nodes C and D and so on. Uh, you could use incidence list to represent in which each vertex stores its incident edges and each edge stores its incident vertices. You can also use adjacency matrix where um, the rows are the source nodes and the columns are the destination nodes. And now this intersection in the cell, you would put zero if it's the, um, from the node to itself, and then one if there is, since we have an unweighted graph, we'll say that the cost is one for if there is existing edge, and the cost is infinity if there's no edge between two nodes. And we can also use incidence matrices where now rows are still nodes, and then uh, columns are edges, and at the intersection we basically put whether the node is a source, a destination, or non-existence in the edge. So adjacency matrices are best at, uh, most efficient at representing dense graphs, and adjacency lists are most efficient at representing sparse graphs. My experience has been that most graphs that we deal with in a day-to-day -day life are sparse graphs, so Loom uses actually adjacency lists to represent graphs internally. So now let's talk about how representing graphs. Um, Can you just say what you mean by dense and sparse? Oh, yes, sorry. So uh, dense graphs are, um, so you ha we have nodes and edges, and there is, um, suppose we have n number of nodes and m number of edges. The maximum number of connectivity that we can have is n times m. So dense graph approaches n times m number of edges. The more edges between the uh, nodes, the more, edge, uh, the more dense it is. And the fewer edges there are, the, uh, the more sparse it is. Okay. So, um, so what about graphs in functional programming world? So what we have is, um, more abstractly, we have structs, which represent data. You know, there are your classes that store some data. Then we have interfaces. What kinds of functionality does the graph provide? What kinds of functions can we call on them? And then we have implementations which connect the two. So it, they provide how do you access this data, this tract, with this API. This allows us for more flexible representation where now graphs don't assume anything about your graph. So as the author of the graph, you have all, all the power to specify what kind of graph you're dealing with. And graphs are uh, generally immutable. So anytime you do modification, you add nodes, remove edges, you get yet a new graph. And in, um, in a lot of uh, functional programming languages, Clojure specifically, I actually use co-algorithms to enable you to keep references to every version that you need so you can backtrack easily, so you can do you know, time travel to previous version of your graph, which is pretty cool. 
So now what we're going to do is we're going to see uh, graph uh, implemented in Clojure. How many of you have written Clojure? Okay, wow, quite a fair number. Okay, awesome. So for those of you not familiar, don't worry about it. I'll walk you through and um, I'll point out the major features of the language so you can follow along. But the syntax is pretty minimal because we're dealing with a list. So, um, so, um, so we define a protocol, which is an interface like in Java. Um, I'm not familiar with Haskell that much, but I think it's more similar to type classes. I'll let the Haskell experts uh, clarify that part. So uh, we define a protocol graph, and we specify which functions you can call on a graph. So you can call a node function, which, which you just provide the graph to it, and then it's able to retrieve the nodes. You can um, retrieve edges. You can specify whether the node or the edge is existent in the graph. You can retrieve successors of the node. You can calculate the number of edges coming out of the node. And you can enumerate all the edges coming out of the node. This is to support the multigraphs. Now we have a protocol for directed graph, also known as that graph. So we have a way to retrieve predecessors given a node in the graph. We have a way to retrieve in degree, so how many edges are actually going into the node. And what are the edges going into the given node. And we also have the function transpose, which basically returns the graph with all the edges reversed. Now we also have a protocol weighted graph, um, which defines just one function, which is a custom weight function, which allows you for weight to be derived from other attributes. So if your weight depends on the airplane distance and maybe on the cost and so on, you can specify how to actually retrieve that data and how to compute that weight. And there's also an editable graph which allows you to edit graphs as persist persistent data structures. So you're able to add nodes, add edges, remove them, and remove everything from the graph. And remember that that will return to you a new graph uh, after each operation. So suppose we wanted to create a more um, complex graph, um, like for instance, a basic editable die graph. How would we go about it? So in Clojure, we'll def our def record defines a type, basic editable die graph. And we'll provide three functions to it, nodes, successors, and predecessors. Now, uh, what you see here is um, extend basic editable die graph. So this is not a single for inheritance like you would do in Java. This is just a pattern for specifying implementation for those protocols. So it would implement three gr uh, protocols, graph, die graph, and editable graph. And what we'll do is, um, We'll, so remember, the graph is all of these functions, and this is just a protocol definition. This is not actually valid code. So now, if we wanted to implement the protocol functions, the API, then what we'll do is we'll actually provide a map. This is a method map. So it's the map of the implementation, where keys are function names and values are the functions. Uh, so let's see how it looks. So we have a key, which is edges function, which will specify how exactly we implement the um, edges function. And then it provides the implementation, which is the value, the function itself, where for each node in the graph, what it's going to do is going to pull out all the edges coming out of that node, and then it's going to return them. And then we'll do similar things to extract the nodes and so on. Now, for directed graph, we will provide a different map, the default graph impl, which will be a map with, where the key is transpose function, um, which will basically take the successors and the predecessor function that we provided and just swap them and return a new graph for us. And um, the other functions to implement are much more trivial to implement, so we're not going to look at those. And then, you know, similarly, we will uh, implement the editable graph protocol you get the idea, the rest is implementation details. So this actually can be uh, found in loom.graph namespace if you're curious to look through the implementation details and try to understand all of it. Okay, so, so how, is, how is it different implementing graphs, representing graphs in functional programming world from object-oriented? So we have our data, our API, and our implementation separately. And our implementation specifies how 
um, API can be called on our data. We have flexible representation, where in this case, I was the author of the graph that decided that I have a basic editable die graph. So I was able to specify exactly which protocols it needs to implement and provide the implementations for them. And finally, we have immutable graphs. So anytime we add a node or add an edge, mutate in any way, it produces yet a new graph for us. Now let's talk about how to implement graph algorithms functionally. Uh, specifically, we will look at the example of Bellman-Ford algorithm. Is anyone here familiar with Bellman-Ford? It's similar to Dextra algorithm in that it finds a path between a single source to all the other vertices in the graph with one caveat. It's actually able to detect negative weight cycle. So a negative weight cycle is when sum of weight of all edges are negative. Why does this matter? Well, there is a negative weight cycle between B, D, and E. Um, the total weight of it is negative one. So when we're traversing in our algorithm the edges, what we're going to think is that every time we traverse the negative weight cycle, we found yet a shorter path and yet a shorter path when we'll never actually converge at a fixed point and we'll run infinitely. So we'd like to detect this as early as possible and quit and say we, couldn't, we can't possibly find the shortest path from the source to all the other nodes because you have negative weight cycle. So uh, this is the description of the Bellman-Ford algorithm in the Introduction to Algorithms book, also known as CLRS. Um, it's common that a lot of algorithms implemented use uh, assuming procedural object-oriented languages. So this is you know, a perfect example for us to see how to map that to functional world. OK, so let's uh, take a look one by one, because there are a couple function definitions which we actually don't see here. So initialize single source tells us that for each vertex, we want to specify that the distance to it is right now infinity because we haven't computed anything. And then the parent pointer is nil. So parent pointer is the vertex that comes before the given vertex when you're finding the path. And now we'll initialize our, for start node, the distance to be zero because it's just the distance to itself. OK, so the way we would implement this is we'll call the init estimates function. The definite minus thing that you see here is actually just a way to specify enclosure. This is a private, so like not accessible publicly method because we're just using that as a helper. Um, so now it takes a graph and a start node. And now we'll specify the node data structure, which is all the nodes except for the start node. And we'll use the disjoint, send to get the, uh, to disjoint set to get all the nodes without the start node. Now we'll initialize cost, which is our path cost from the start vertex to all the other vertices. And uh, in, what interleave does is it basically gives us the uh, mapping from the node to infinity. It turns out that um, infinity words itself is long. It's too long to put on the slides given this font. So <laughs> the, um, the squiggly symbol is the infinity symbol that you see here. Um, and so we will also define paths because we want to figure out how to get, um, uh, we want to f uh, store the parent pointers in our case. Uh, so we'll provide the mapping from node to nil because we haven't computed its parent pointers yet. Okay, and now basically we want to initialize our cost um, with start node mapped to zero as a cost and start node will not ever have the parent pointer so we'll just uh, map it to nil. Okay, so, so far so good. Now on line four, we define a function called relax. The way you can think about the function without um, bothering with the implementation um, is given the two vertices, u and v, and the cost between them, which is w, if we have a current path to node v from the start node, and we have a path to the u node, and there is an edge between u and v, is there a shorter path to node v from the start node traversing the u? So in this case, on, on the right-hand side, uh, so from the start node to node v, the cost so far we've computed is 4. Now, to get to u node, it only costs us 2. And to get to um, node v through node u, it costs us 3. So we would like to relax the edge because we found a shorter path through that node. Now, notice that on line six and on line one of a relaxed function, we have exact same condition. So let's pull that out into its own function. So we'll define can relax edge function, where we'll specify three arguments. Edge, 
which can also be referred to as by its elements u and v, and then the edge cast and the cast map, the, the help of data structure that we created at the beginning. So now we will pull out the v uh, distance to v by um, getting that from the map of cast that we computed so far and the distance to u. And now we will also compute the sum, so this, um, the path going through node u to node v. And now we'll just return the result of comparing them. Okay, so now to implement the whole thing for relax um, function, what we'll do is again, we'll take the edge, which we can also refer to its vertices as UV. This is called uh, the structuring enclosure, which is a pretty cool feature of it. Um, and now we, it will take the UV cost, which is basically our W, and it will uh, take our internal data structure that we've been keeping around estimates, which uh, encapsulates costs and paths. So now we'll get the uh, cost to U function, um, no, cost to u vertex, we'll compute the sum, and then if we can relax the edge, then we would like to update our cost and parent pointers. So we will update the cost map and the paths map, and otherwise we'll just return the estimates, the help data structure as is, without modifying it. Okay, so now let's do this for each edge in the graph. We'll relax it. So we'll specify function relax edges, which takes the graph, the start node, and our estimates help a data structure. And we will re use reduce function for iterating over all elements. So we would um, specify reduce function, which um, on the bottom we see goes over each um, edge. And what we will do is for each edge, it will take the, initial, the initialized estimates function and it's going to try to relax each edge and update the estimates data structure as we go along. Okay, so now we're actually very close to being done, uh, tying this all together, but you probably can't see it, so don't worry, we'll actually take a look step by step. Um, but before we do that, um, let's take a um, short break to reflect on what we uh, know so far. So we used function composition we define functions, we pulled out a separate function for defining the condition, we um, compose that with relax edge, we use that inside the relax edge, now we define a, a different function for relax edges which code internally relax edge and so on. And functions operated on a lot of different helper data structures, so we actually had two, costs and paths, which, uh, which were, we refer to it as estimates overall. And uh, we used higher order functions such as reduce to help us with that. So reduce helped us to iterate over elements. And um, um, reduce actually is a very interesting function, but I'm not gonna talk about all its algebraic properties. It's probably, it deserves a talk on its own. Uh, but I, um, if you're interested, uh, I highly recommend you look into that, how it works. Um, so now going, going back to the Bellman Ford function. So tying it all together, so we'll define a Bellman Ford function which takes the graph and the start node, and now we will initialize the, um, sorry, so we'll initialize the estimates um, by calling the function init estimates, and now we will relax edges. So on line two, you see we do this for, uh, we do this v minus one times. So what we'll do is we will call the, a reduce function on edges, and this is the trick to do the v minus one times. Um, if this doesn't quite make sense to you, um, I'll post the slides online and you can verify to yourself that it actually works, trust me it does. <laughs> but um, the, the cool thing about it is that now you take the reduce function, you pull out, the, um, you specify how to operate over edges, and now you specify how many times to do this by um, calling, so you count the number of nodes, and then, so that's V, and you decrement that, so that's minus one, and then you do that over the range, one to V minus one. Okay, so now, um, for the part that actually does detection of negative void cycle. So, so far we computed the path from the start node to all the other vertices. Now we wanna know if there is a negative void cycle, which means that we're just, if we keep iterating, we're gonna keep finding shorter and shorter paths. And the way we do, we do this is this. So some function enclosure basically returns to you the value itself, which is truth enclosure, or returns to you a nail which is evaluated to false. So here what we want to do is we want to see is there an edge that we can still relax 
And if we find such edge that um, returns to us that we could relax it, then we will, will exit immediately and return false. And otherwise, well, the, the, function, um, the algorithm description here says return true, but that's not really helpful. So let's return parent pointers itself. And the construction of parent pointers um, you know, is just mangling more of internal data structures and calling more functions on them. So, okay, so what we've seen so far when implementing graph algorithms functionally is that everything was a function. And functions operate on, on lots of different internal data structures, which were themselves just maps, lists, infinite sequences, and we um, operate in them back and forth. And every function returns to us a new representation. So the estimates um, that we computed initially, then we passed it to function, and um, there was actually two data structures, cost and path, we updated them as we went, and we got a new copy of it. Okay, so now let's talk about what Loom does. So as I mentioned, Loom is a graph algorithms and visualization library written in Clojure. It's accessible on GitHub. It supports a variety of graphs. Um, it has undirected graphs, directed graphs, weighted graphs, Multigraphs, which we mentioned earlier, which you can specify many edges between two different nodes. It also supports fly graphs, which are read-only ad hoc uh, graphs. Uh, this is something that we call fly graphs. Um, so what they are able to do is they're able to infer, given a few functions, they're able to infer other ones that it needs to call. For instance, if you give it node and successes functions, ways to retrieve them, then it will figure out a way to retrieve edges. And if you give it successors and the start node, then it will figure out how to retrie retrieve nodes and edges. So it supports also a variety of algorithms. It supports depth first search and breadth first search. So on the left hand side, you see the walk of the tree using depth first search, where it first tries to go as deep as it can and then backtrack and explores the rest of the tree whereas breadth first search tries to explore each level of the tree one by one. And it also has a bi-directional breadth first search um, implemented. In addition, it has topological of sort, um, where every success of a vertex is guaranteed to come after it in the ordering. It computes a variety of uh, shortest path algorithms, including Dextra, but one for that we looked at earlier um, a star, which is commonly used in AIs to compute path finding, and Johnson's algorithm, which uh, instead of computing from single source to all the paths, it, uh, to all the vertices in the graph, it computes all pair shortest paths, so from all the uh, vertices to all the other vertices, uh, and it specifically does that on sparse weighted directed graphs. Uh, there are actually um, also algorithms to compute clicks using Braun Kerbosch. Um, for finding maximal clicks in an undirected graph. So clicks are, um, if, when you have a click, what it guarantees is that every vertex is adjacent to every other. So there is a direct, uh, direct edge between all the other vertices in the click. Now, uh, SEC is strongly connected components, which slightly relaxes this notion. Uh, strongly connected components defined by every vertex is reachable from every other vertex in the um, strongly connected component. So it doesn't have to have a direct edge, but it needs to have a path. Uh, so uh, we compute strongly connected components using Kasaraj algorithm. Um, there's also a density function, which computes just the ratio of edges to nodes. Uh, so it's, you are able to um, figure out whether how dense your graph is or how sparse your graph is. There's also a loner node. Way to, um, way to compute loner nodes. So on this graph that we see, G is the loner node because it's not connected to all the other nodes in the graph. Um, there's also greedy coloring um, and two coloring algorithms. So greedy coloring, what it does is, as soon as it cannot find um, a color from the currently used set of colors, it would just assign a new color. Um, and two coloring uh, is used to figure out whether the graph is by Apartheid. So if you're able to do two coloring on a graph, that means your graph is apartheid. And there's also max flow um, <coughs> algorithm using Edmonds curve, which um, finds a feasible uh, flow through a single source, sync, uh, single sync flow network that is maximum. <coughs> 
Um, I couldn't put it on the slide, but there's also a minimum spanning tree. So remember I mentioned that your graphs, uh, your trees are also graphs. So what Prim's algorithm does is it computes minimum spanning tree for a connected weighted undirected graph. Um, so when it traverses and figures out which tree to compute, it picks the nodes that have minimal edges. So it's guaranteed that they, uh, it picks edges that have minimal weight. So it's guaranteed that all the, wedge, uh, all the edges in the minimum spanning tree are minimal from this subset that it could have picked. So the previous algorithms I mentioned are in lambda alg namespace. Uh, there's also alg generic namespace. Um, which basically um, allows you to run graph algorithms without any knowledge of the graph representation. Um, so you don't have to implement Loom's graph API to use Alg Generic. Um, so basically, Alg Generic doesn't know anything about underlying representation of the graph, so it requires only successors function, and it requires a start node for depth for search and breadth for search because you have to start somewhere and um, also for topological sort and extra algorithm. And it, uh, also if you want to find a breadth for search path between two different nodes, then it requires an end node as well. And as I mentioned, uh, Loom is a graph visualization library. So it uses GraphVis's, um, um, GraphVis, uh, which is a um, commonly used um, graph rep um, representation library. Uh, visualization library. So um, by default, it uses a uh, dot algorithm for those of you familiar, but you can also specify other layout algorithms if you wanted to pretty easily. So um, what I wanted to find out for myself um, is whether Loam is actually as uh, flexible and as unopinionated about graphs as I claimed it was. So I implemented um, uh, three different uh, ways to represent three different graphs from three different problem domains and represented them in Loom. So one of them was um, I took a core async single static assignment form function. So basically what it does is it takes the, the go block and um, represents the program in a single static assignment form, which is a common representation that compilers generate for a program. Um, I also represented, uh, so titanium uh, is a closure wrap around Titan DB. So I stored some uh, data in the in-memory Titan DB, and then I specified a, a way to have your data represented in Loom and run graph algorithms on your data in the Titanium database. And I also took the uh, dependency graph of closure GitHub repositories and tried to figure out what are the most commonly uh, used libraries are besides the, you know, the closure core libraries. And there are actually an infinite number of graphs that can be represented by Loom. Um, I know that uh, some people use it to represent their workflows. Um, so uh, if you want to figure out, um, specify a way to build your code and roll it out into staging environment production, you could use Loom. Um, I, uh, there is, I think, a research group in Berkeley that um, is, used it for some time to represent, um, prog uh, to do a program representation of their, uh, com for their compiler. And um, I'm sure there are many more that I don't know of yet, but if you're playing with it, and um, let me know what you're doing with um, your Loom in in integration. Okay, so let's wrap up. Um, functional graphs are very interesting, very um, somewhat new field um, for a lot of people to think about because they should be represented differently. Um, if you want to learn more about how to represent data structures in a functional world. There's a fantastic book by Chris Akasaki called Purely Functional Data Structures. You may have to learn standard ML. That's the language that the examples are in. But um, many people have found that it was pretty easy to follow without actually understanding standard ML. So what are some takeaways? Well, when we represent graphs functionally, our data and our functions are separate. So unlike an object-oriented world where we had um, nodes and we specify nodes what kind of operations you can do, and edges specify, like object edge specifies what kind of operations you can do on them, in functional uh, FP world, those are separate. So your data lives somewhere, like it lived in my you know, titanium database, right, like the graph database, and then I, my functionality, which was Loom, had some API, and then I specified how exactly to retrieve it from the database. Um, 
functional graphs uh, have a much more flexible representation because they don't make any assumptions about your graph. So it's all up to the graph author to figure out what kind of graph they want. You may actually have a directed um, unweighted graph, and for some problems you may want to treat it as unweighted, and for some other problems you want to treat it as weighted graph because you want to compute some properties on it. So you're able to do that. And um, the other third takeaway is graphs are immutable in the FP world. So anytime you do a mutation to the graph, it's yet a different graph. Unlike an object-oriented world, you just you know keep changing things, and maybe it's uh, it's never the same graph. But as you pass it to your um, user, maybe they'll do something else to it, and you know return to it, and you don't really know what happened to it. Well, and takeaway number four is use Loom if you have graph algorithms problems, if you have any need for graphs. Um, cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming. Thank you.